Well, this morning we're going to take back up in our study through Titus. So Titus chapter 2, where Paul is instructing Titus again how to put the church in order and the, the way for the church of God to be the light that God has designed for it to be in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And so we, we are to be the light of the world. And there is something so sanctifying and beautiful when a community of individual souls comes under the rule and the reign and fellowship of Jesus Christ. It becomes really heaven on earth. It, it shows forth the glory of God. And that is what we desire to be, is just a little signpost of what glory will be like, what is coming. So you may not see Jesus now, but you get a glimpse by looking at Southside Bible Church where we are in Him and He's in us and we are manifesting Him to this world. It's a little colony of heaven right here in Denver. A group who are subjected to the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with His Spirit, doing the works of God on this earth, loving like no other people, speaking the truth in love. So in Titus, we are learning what that will look like practically. We see that there is sound doctrine that is proclaimed and protected so we understand God, who He is, what He's doing, what He will do. And then the saints, the older, are pouring into the younger, teaching each other how to put Christ on display in our daily lives. So in community, in love, and in oneness, we're helping each other make much of God. And so let's go before God and pray that he will do this beautiful thing. And the responses from last week are so amazing. I just see people dreaming and thinking of new ways of how we can do this and put God on display. And so thank you for submitting to the word of God. And now let's be led by his spirit. Let's go to our God. Father, I'll never get over that the veil has been torn in two. Your very hands just took them and took that veil and ripped it right down the middle to symbolize and to preach and to show us that now we have access to the living God. Lord, we now dwell with you. We are one with you and you're one with us. God, I thank you that you are the gospel. And I thank you that you have brought us to you. And I thank you now that corporately, Lord, we put that on display. And you're teaching us how to, to know you and how to pour into one another to help each other grow and manifest Jesus Christ to this world. And so we thank you for your design and your structure. And so we look to your spirit then to do it. God, we pray that you will accomplish this beautiful thing in our very midst. And so we submit to you, O oh God. We love you and we treasure you. Teach us this morning in the word of God, I pray. Amen. Well, as we begin, I want to pull out really this morning and give you a bird's eye view so we don't miss it. We're, we're kind of looking at the trees in the forest, and I just want to start with the forest and then come in on the trees. One of the great confessions that was ever written is the Westminster Catechism, and it asks one of the most important questions, really, that you can ever ask yourself. What is the chief end of man? I, I, you need to know this. Why, why do I exist? Why am I here? Why do I go to school? Why am I training my children? All of these things. Why do I go to work? Just that big question of why am I here? And if you get this wrong, you will get all of life wrong. If you miss it, you miss everything. And so the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That is the chief end of man, is to put God on display and to enjoy Him forever. And the second question kind of summarized is what rule then has been given to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever? And the answer is the Holy Word of God, the Bible. The Bible is where God shows us and teaches us how can we glorify Him. And so when we think of glorifying God, I just want to make sure we understand first the intrinsic glory of God. That is that this is what is essential to His being. You can't add to it and you can't subtract from it. God is altogether glorious. He's perfect. He's magnificent. He's transcendent. We will never add to that glory. He is glorious. So when we think of glorifying God, it's this other aspect of His manifested glory. It's others seeing the worth and the glory of who God is, valuing it and worshiping it. And so there is our calling, is we're not going to add to God, but we want to just put that worth on display for all to see. So when we are called to glorify God, we're going to add nothing to His intrinsic glory. 
But I always like the idea of it's like an aluminum can when you're driving and it's on a mountain and the sun hits it and it just reflects and radiates. And that's our calling is it's, I just want to reflect and radiate and shine the glory of God to this world. The great Puritan Thomas Watson said there are four words as he was trying to explain how to glorify God. The first is appreciation. That God, you are exalted far above all gods. I appreciate that you are that. Then it's adoration. Given to God the glory that is due His name and worship. I ascribe honor and worth and glory to you, O God. Thirdly, he says, is affection. It's not so much that we receive sun and food and rain from Him, but he says this is love or delight that sets your heart upon God as a treasure. And so there's a, there's a love for this God, and I see him as the highest treasure of anything that I will ever pursue, seek, or dream of. He is to be um, loved and treasured. And fourthly, Watson says, then that brings subjection. Subjection, uh, subjecting our lives and our members to God. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And so here's my life, and it, it's in your word, and it's in the Bible that you show me now how to be subjected to you, how to live the life of God, how to live the life that you want for me. And so there, there's a subjection to God. And so if you get this right, it'll affect everything that you do. And I know that you hit kind of that midlife sometimes. We joke about it in the world, but I'm telling you, it happens in the church too, where people will hit that midlife and all of a sudden, they, they, they slow down just a little bit and start thinking and say, this isn't what I thought it would be. It didn't go, my life didn't go the way I had dreamed or hoped. It really took a different turn. My marriage, um, it didn't do what I thought it would. Many in college, and they come out, and they're like, well, my, th this career didn't do what I thought it would do. My kid is sick. My husband's been taken away. We've got to get this answer right. We can't be like the world that just chases Fridays. They, just, they, they live Monday through Thursday just always with their eye on Friday. Can't just be a mom doing her 14th load of laundry going, why? Why am I here sweeping floors again at work? What in the world am I doing? And the answer is, I am glorifying God and I am enjoying Him forever. This big picture comes into day-to-day -day life with the failures and everything that you will face and go through. This is what it's all about. If, if, if you are not getting your piece of the pie, it's about God. And it's about glorifying Him in all things. Enjoying Him as your treasure in everything. This is my chief end. You know what a chief end is? A chief end is you got all these different ends in life. Like if I get strep throat, I go to the doctor, that's not my chief end. I get a prescription, that's not my chief end. My chief end is I, I just want to feel better. And so when you have a chief end, it means every end in your life is pointing to one thing. So everything that I do, it has one ultimate goal, aim, and everything. And the Scriptures declare that that one thing that I shoot at above everything else is the glory of God and enjoying Him forever. Step back into Titus 2 with me now. From that view from the moon, uh, looking at earth, here is how we glorify God and we enjoy Him right now. The structure that God has given us in our lives. The character that we as men and women are striving to do and be. There is a godliness that comes from a community beholding Jesus Christ together. And there's an order and there's a structure. This is not, I, I don't like that. Last week, Pastor, I didn't like that. My sphere of influence is I'm a CEO, and I influence corporations, not homes. I'm old. I'm just going to sit back and let all the young ones do all the work now. I don't care what you said, that I'm in my glory years. I don't want to give my life to others. This is how we glorify God. Titus 2 has been saying it from every angle. This is how you'll put God on display in, in, in uh, let's see, in verse 5, uh, verse 10, verse 15. It just keep again and again. This is how you will glorify God when you live Titus 2, and it begins to shape and mold and put God on display. 
So I just, I say that for one reason, to not do this is no small thing. This is how you're going to put God on display. Titus is, Paul is so clear in Titus about that. This is how you're going to enjoy him in community together, learning from each other, the beauty of what you're beholding, what you're seeing. This is how you're going to enjoy using our gifts together to build each other up and to our head, Jesus Christ. Jesus tells a parable about talents that he's given us. And he says, you're going to give an account for how you used them on the last day. And it just kills me to think about the guy who walks up to Jesus with all of his notebooks. And he just says, look at this. I have one for every book of the Bible. I, I have taken more notes than anyone who's ever lived. I have the highest view of God than anyone back on earth. And he'll say, did all of that truth about me lead you to love and live like me? Did you engage the body of Christ and use all of this great knowledge to help them? Well, no, it was just for me. Did you share this amazing truth and doctrine with unbelievers? No, just my kids. Did you edify and build up the body of Christ? No, but I destroyed an Arminian that came 500 yards within my home every time. I pray that we're getting this. I'm not going to let up on this until you surrender to the truth of his word and glorify God by living it out. So enough of looking at the forest. Let, let's go look at some trees. Titus 2. Older women, verse 2. You're to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith and love and in perseverance. Uh, old, those are the men, older women, Likewise, you're to be reverent in your behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine and teaching what is good. In verse 4 through 5, younger women, so that you may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And now this morning, if you'll look at young men, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. And all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame and having nothing bad to say about us. So let's take up this morning the young men. Likewise, in verse 6, so in the same manner as the older women teaching the younger women how to live godly lives. I want the older men to come and teach the younger men how to live the life of Christ. So let's look at the older men, what you're to impart to the younger men in this church. Look in verse 6. I urge the young men to be sensible. The young men really have their own set of problems. Uh, young men tend to be headstrong. That's not always the case but they're a little more intense. Have any of you ever had girls, little baby girls, and then you had a baby boy, and you're just like, what happened? You just, you see it right away. They're just wrestling on the floor, and they want a football, and it just, it happens almost instantly. They're just more intense. There are really some dangerous years. These years, young men are dangerous years for them. The scriptures warn throughout and I've watched many make shipwreck of their faith during these years. I can't tell you how important these years are for you young men. And older men, here is your calling to help these guys not shipwreck. You need the older men to navigate these years. The last thing you want at this age is usually help or counsel. Praise God for the young man who stood up here saying, I want this. This is not, gonna, this is not going to glorify God if you don't. Humble yourselves, young men. As I've lived for 50 years now, I love being able to say that. I've lived for 50 years. I want to go over a couple of dangers that I see for young men through my own journey. And I've drawn from commentators and different preachers and just kind of tried to bring together this morning some of the things that young men battle. And then I'll go back into Titus 2. One of the things that I've seen is the sin of laziness. Many today throughout history, because of the fall, the curse will be, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to work, and you just seem opposed to it. It's not natural to be a go-getter. I've seen a few, and a lot of times their, their motivation is even wrong, but it, most often they're lazy. They need motivation to work hard. 
In homes that lack discipline, laziness is usually abounding. We have some men here in this church who have taught me so much about hard work, and every one of their kids are hard workers. Every one of them. The home is where they are the center. Uh, A home that makes the kid the center of the universe, what happens? They're spoiled. And the mindset is how others can serve you. I see it again and again. What can you do for me? Mom will do it. Why won't you do it? Homes where there's too much money and you, your kids never want for anything. Homes where there's no parents around, if left to themselves, guess what? Most often they are going to be lazy. And so this is such a dangerous time for young men because so many foundations are being built right now at this age. So your work ethic matters greatly. And next week, God will open that up in Titus to us. But for now, it matters. And so if you are not disciplined, you need help from the older men. You need the men who have learned how to discipline themselves unto godliness and life and how to take care of their families. I, I, the number one thing I'm seeing now is young men who are lazy and they all want to get married, but they don't have a job. Lastly, don't rename this sin of laziness. You know what I usually am told? I just trust God. Uh, he, he gives to his children when they're sleeping. And my favorite one is I'm pacing myself. For what? <laughs> For what? You're pacing yourself. Young men, we are not to be lazy for the king of kings. Secondly, as it's a time where you get your freedom, you, you move out from your family, maybe you buy a car. I remember that feeling the first time I pulled out of my driveway was just, Freedom! And now I can eat anything I want. I can do anything I want. I, I don't have to sleep. These kids, they just drink coffee all hours and they sleep about four hours a night. I have all this freedom and I don't know what to do with it. So if you are not under discipline or control, this is a dangerous season. And so we need older men to teach the younger men, how do I use this glorious freedom that God has given to me at this stage of life? Thirdly, this is a decadent culture. I don't think anyone would argue with that one. You live in a culture that is accustomed to vice. The whole thing is just marketing vices on people. Here's a different thing that a young man needs to destroy his life, and you'll never be happy without it. There's one just on every turn, drugs. I'm astounded at the statistics of drugs and what they do. Alcohol, materialism, impurity, folly, entertainment. There's just a vice on every turn, and we need the older men to teach us how not to get caught in all of these device, vices of this culture that we live in. There are so many snares for young men. You need help and you need protection to walk this path. And everyone I know who has done this alone in his own wisdom, I call an addict. You won't even see it most of the time. It is so dangerous. You need help. You need help in this area. Fourthly, is it a godless education? Our, our, edu- our institutions and training, they're just, they're godless. And the most vulnerable years, you're just sitting under satanic influence, seeking to lead you away from God. They'll attack God, they'll attack the Bible. Christianity's mocked and jeered at these universities. It's a dangerous time where these foundations are being established. Get a mentor. Get a mentor. Praise God. We, we had almost 40 kids a couple weeks ago on the DU campus, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and we're just opening up the Word of God, and these kids are pouring out their hearts and helping one another to fight in this crooked and perverse generation. And so here they are in the middle of such a liberal college with the Word of God being open, preached, proclaimed, and them receiving and loving and working. Isn't that beautiful? Get mentors at that time of life. I just can't encourage you enough. And then fifthly is just the immaturity. Youth is immature. And when I was a youth, I didn't think so. Youth is immature. You have not been seasoned and grown yet. You, you know it all, but you really don't. There's not a lot of experiential knowledge yet in many years. My dad always said, you can always tell a teenager, but not much. <clears throat> I don't know why he said that to me. But you just, you've, you're immature. 
And some of you get married and you'll tell me, I know how to love my wife. It's easy. Right, guys? I was shocked when I realized Laura didn't think the way and act like a guy did. I had six brothers, no sisters, and I was shocked when I got married. And I couldn't understand why did it bother her that all my toothpaste dripped on the faucet. Like, what, why would you make your bed in the morning? That's silly to me. You need to learn. Immaturity that you need to own. Temptation is strongest in youth. So many habits for life in youth. And I'll, I'll just, men do not get addicted to lust and pornography. I have never seen a sin destroy men more. And I'm reading and seeing these things. They're saying it's worse than drugs. It is causing more problems. They can see it on CAT scans now. Uh, it's destroying. It's, it's making paved ways in your brain. It's going to destroy you and mess you up. And I'm just telling you right now, do not get into that. And get a mentor if you have. And if you haven't, get a mentor so you don't. It's the most destructive sin that I've watched with young men in this society. At this age, you also have an imagined invincibility. You think you can do anything. So you just need help from those who have been seasoned by life. Come back with me to verse 6. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. The word for urge, it's a very strong word in the Greek. It means to exhort, to instruct, or to admonish. It literally means to influence through the spoken word. And so we have got to help the young men Uh, say the hard things, the instructive things, the edifying things, the protective things. Older men, just speak into their lives. Say what they need. Help them. Don't beat around the bush. Urge them. This is a, a really strong word. Admonish these young guys. Don't you feel a responsibility to the young men? What a blessing one of my dear friends has been in the college group, an older man just coming, and he preaches and teaches to them and prays with them and gives his life away. Rick and Greg right now at the training institute with those guys. We just need all of you to do this right. All of the older men, urge. Come urge these young guys on to life and godliness. So what should we urge them to in verse 6? The first characteristic is I want them to be sensible. Can you think of a better word for a young man than the word sensible? Uh, When I spend an evening with them on Friday nights, I never walk away going, man, they're sensible. I can see, urge them, urge them. What it means is to control themselves, to have self-control, to develop self-mastery. Paul said, I buffet my body and I make it my slave, lest after I preach to others, I myself might be disqualified. I, I literally give myself a black eye, Paul says. It's to bring your longings and your desires into harness, to develop discernment in life. Young men, urge them to have self-control and power over their faculties, to control their lives. Later, Titus is gonna, Paul's going to say to Titus to live sensibly and righteously in this present age. Teach them how to have self-control in this day and age. And if you'll look at the end of verse 6 and verse 7, it says, in all things. That could attach to verse 6 or it could attach to verse 7. It could go either way. I am leaning with just attaching it to verse 6. Let them be sensible in all things, to learn self-control in everything, a balanced behavior in all areas of your life. That's why they need the older men. It's not just one area. It's every area that I need to help them grow to master these areas of their life. And so there's so many baits and lures that Satan drops on young men. They're everywhere, and we want to teach them how not to bite every bait that is dropped in front of them. Mistakes do not always have to be your teacher. The older men can be your teacher. Wisdom can be your teacher. Look with me then in verse 7. So in all things then, show yourselves to be an example of good deeds. Titus, confront them by your example. A holy man, Spurgeon said, is a powerful instrument in the hand of God. A holy man is a powerful instrument in the hand of God. So an exhortation to urge lacks power without example. 
And so what he's getting at is hypocrisy is not going to help. If the older men are urging the younger men and you're a hypocrite, let me exhort you not to be foolish while I play the fool. It'll never work. To have self-control while I'm materialistic. To avoid the pitfalls of, of women while I'm failing in that area miserably. And so this is what the young men need. Men who model a life that is sold out to Jesus Christ. They can, they can watch it and they can see it. They need to see it. They need to see what does it look like to walk with Jesus Christ day to day. The number one question I get asked, older men, give them the answer. Follow me around for a week and I'll give you an answer. That is what it looks like. I see Christ in that man. I want that. It means more to me now that I see it grown up and flushed out, says the young man. This cannot be do as I say, but not as I do. Dads, there's no greater power than the power of example to match your words. Your kids are just looking for a reason to chuck this. And it's hard. And it's against the current of their culture. And all they need is a hypocrite of a dad. And they'll take it and they'll run with it. They just, they want that. So as an elder was called not to not be perfect but blameless, we deal with our sin rightly. Dads, deal with your sin rightly, but let's be gr growing up in the faith to give examples and models. Give them an example of a sinful man who will never let go of Jesus Christ. He just keeps growing. One of the golfers at DU, he just shared with me the respect he has for his dad. And the example that he has been, it just has his heart. It is just beautiful to see his eyes glow when he talks about his dad. Dad has a lot of sin and shortcomings, but we love Christ. And that, that has been my pursuit all of my days. Give that example, men, to the younger men. Let them see someone who loves Christ, and I will not be turned away from the glory of God. Listen to Hebrews 13:7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, Paul said, be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. And 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no one look down on your youthfulness but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. And that's what Titus was to this church, a young man who was even an example to the young men. The Greek word for example, it literally meant a blow with a hammer, and the hammer, it left the print of the nail in it. It was the word for die or mold, the imprint of virtue, a life that they can follow. And so it's so crucial to give examples of the faith then to young men. Have you ever noticed, I think anyone who's had kids, how quickly young boys uh, find heroes? I mean, just instantly, they're, they're looking for a role model. And you get some guy who hits a home run or catches a touchdown, and it's like, that's my role model. And they're just, it's like it's just innate. It's crazy. They were made and wired to want examples. Let's give them right here at Southside so they don't have to go find some crazy athlete who doesn't even love God. So they don't have to go to the world to find them. We have some mighty examples of men who have walked in the faith, who love Christ, and I have watched you rejoice in sufferings. You've made your hope the next life. Look to these examples, young men. Get around them and just follow them. Learn from them. The example of good deeds, it means moral excellence. Be a pattern of spiritual goodness in everything you do, older men. The younger men are watching. Let's show them how to commune with God and be conformed to his image. Let's model that. Let's show them that. In verse 7, show yourselves to be an example of good deeds with purity of doctrine. You be an example of purity. That word means uncorruptness. Uh, corruption means moral filth or defiled. It's really the worst of behaviors. And so this is, this is talking about behavior here. And the teaching is that you, 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 live, you live the teaching without corruption. 
The word for doctrine, it, uh, it means the teaching, the teaching, uncorrupted obedience to the teaching, to the Word of God. So young men know the Word of God and what they're being exhorted here, teach them how to live into it, teach them integrity. Teach them that you don't just learn about the Bible and that's it. You learn about God so that you can live it, so you can know Him and live unto it. Don't stuff your head full with data and facts and Bible stories and stop there. Don't go to a training institute and think that's the end goal. Live it out. James said, don't merely be hearers of the Word who what? Deceive themselves. That Greek word means to miscalculate. Two plus two equals five. I, I, all I do is I learn everything and I don't have to live it out. And he says, you're going to miscalculate. You're going to stand before God and God will say the answer is four. Be ready. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word of God. I hear it. And I love that he didn't just say do the word. He, he used a, a noun, be doers. This is just what we are. We're to be doers of the word of God. So how are you doing, young men? Is there a growing chasm between what you're learning and what you're living One of the hardest times in my life was seminary because I was learning so much and I had no time to practically work it out. And there was just this slow uh, killing and drying up and dying. And so I just, how are you doing, young men? How are you doing with what, what all you're learning? Is there becoming this huge chasm or are you getting alone with God and seeking Him and getting around older men and learning how do I work this out in day to day life? Let the older men help you bridge the gap. Let them help you bridge. And if you're an older guy and, and there's this massive gap, you go fix that. There, there, there needs to be this, what I'm learning of God and what I'm beholding and what I'm becoming. I want to model that to the younger men. Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. With all my heart I have sought thee. Do not let me wander from thy commandments. Thy word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Older men, teach them how to do this. This is not didasco. This is mentoring under God, unto godliness. To give them that hymn we used to always sing, just a closer walk with thee. Mentor. Look with me in verse 7. Dignified. The word dignified. Teach them to be dignified. That is a, a word that we're losing that I think is very important. It, it means a seriousness. I mean, what, what does every sitcom do? It teaches against this. It's all foolishness with laugh tracks. How can I be foolish and silly and frivolous? You can't be serious. There was a point in my life where all I read was dead guys. I just, I just read Puritans, and that was it. And I was sitting under a legalistic preacher. And so I was taking all this in, and I lost all of my joy. And I was sober and serious about everything. Nothing was funny anymore. My wife just said, do you ever smile anymore? And I was like, what, what happened? And then Pastor Rick Anderson came to our church, <clears throat> and he preached on heaven and hell. And there was a weightiness like I've never heard before in preaching. And I was just trembling as he brought the word of God to us. And there was such a sobriety to it. And then the next night we, I forget which house we went to, but we put on Remember the Titans. And he's standing up there imitating it. And just, I mean, he's just a cut up. And we're all just rolling and laughing. And I'm like, wait a minute. The, the, The weightiness he had with heaven and hell and now the joy he has in just watching a movie and and delighting and treasuring all that he had, it just it blew me away to say, what is this? And what I learned is be serious about what is serious and, and enjoy what God has called you to enjoy. I've said it before, I, I laugh more than I used to laugh and I cry more than I used to cry. Young men, learn how to be serious about what's serious and learn how to have joy and fun in what is designed to be fun. So don't model to the young men, how to grow old and crotchety and cynical. Model how to be dignified. Model to them how to, how to be, be dignified people, to, to be serious about the things of God and that there are souls that are dying and that are going to go to hell. There, there, there should be a certain dignity. We should be dignified. And I, I pray that we have that, and I'm not saying be lemon-sucking Christians. 
to have that balance Rick Anderson had. And I, I want you to, to find that, that, that beautiful seriousness about the things of God and the delight and the joy of what all he's given us in Christ. Be, be that beautiful balance. Older men teach the younger men this beautiful thing. Then he says, be sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. Speech is the word logos. Uh, this is not a call to teach sound theology. And again, we are to do that in chapter 1. But this is to talk uh, in a healthy way is really what this Greek phrase is working at. Talk in a healthy way. In Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need for the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. The women were called don't be gossips, and the men will always be like, oh, the women are gossips. But what I see with the younger men is it's just you just tear each other down. You beat each other and you kick each other. If you got a big nose, you make fun of your nose. If you're balding, you make fun of their hair. I, you just tear each other apart, okay? Women might be prone to gossip. Men, you're prone to tearing each other down with your words. And he says, use words that will build up and edify. Sound, that Greek word means to be healthy or wholesome. Speak, speech that is healthy and edifying and building up. That is the cry for the young men. Older men, give them this. Give them something better of how we speak and use our tongues to, to build people up for the kingdom of God. And so my question to you this morning is why? Why does that even matter, young men? Why be sensible? Why be an example of good deeds and purity of doctrine and dignified and sound in speech that is above reproach? Look with me at the end of verse 8. Here we have a, a, another, I'm sorry, in verse, yeah, verse 8. Uh, having sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. And there's a hint clause again, and we've had several of these. We had it. At the end for the women, it said, so that in verse 5, the word of God will not be dishonored. Here's another hint of clause, and next week there'll be another one as well. But in this one, the, the purpose, it's a purpose statement, so that the opponent will not be put, will, so that the opponent, I'm sorry, will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. And so they, 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 the, the world wants to criticize us and they want to malign us, but it, it will shame them. They'll, they'll try to criticize you and nothing will stick. They won't even be able to find anything to really come after you about. There was this man that I love named Robert Chapman. He was friends with Spurgeon and some of those guys in that age. And there was a debate between these two on theology. And the one, they, they started making fun of Chapman's theology. And the one said, I wonder if he's even a Christian. And the other guy on his side said, stop. That man's life is so beautiful. It's so Christ reflective. We can't even attack his doctrine. And it's just he was so just God-honoring and beautiful in the way he lived his life that no one could even say anything bad about him. Could you imagine a politician like that? Guys, we live in a world that evaluates a man by his car and what he does for a job. What do you do for a living? And they value a man by who he knows. Who are your friends? Let's talk about you know, the movers and shakers. What, what do you own? What, what assets do you have? Is your wife an it's, it's so broken. This is what makes a man. Does he live to glorify God and enjoy him forever? Is that really your chief end as you sit here right now? That's what makes a man. My chief end in everything I do is to put God on display. And when the bottom comes out, and my job seems mundane, and I'm tired of pushing a broom or flipping burgers. I got fussy children all the time, and they fight over everything. Are you living for the glory of God? Not to feel good about yourself or to impress others, but just for the name that is above every name. So here it is, men. We live in a culture where they're trying to feminize us. Last week we saw the, the, the women are trying to become men and the men are trying to become women. And men don't even know what it is to be men anymore. We're now the weaker sex in our society. And Paul, he says, act like men. 
Let us be leaders in the church and in our homes and in our communities and our offices and our schools. Let us follow the one who is fully God and fully man. He is our example of a true man, a true man of God. And so, men, we can't abdicate our duty and our calling. We are called to lead, to be men, but most importantly, to be men of God. Older men, teach us how to do this. Younger men, humble yourself and learn from these men so that the enemies of the cross will have nothing bad to say about this group. They, they'll have nothing. They won't have anything to even pick at. Praise God for the response of the women last week. I had them coming up by the droves, dreaming and planning of ways to make this happen. How can we get with the older women? Older women are, how can we do these things for the younger women? I mean, you're dreaming and you're thinking of ways to pour into each other's lives. Men, seek ways to make this happen. Let the Spirit lead us to be a community that teaches one another how to walk deeply with Jesus Christ and to put Him on display in a dark and dying world. Let's, let's join... I keep getting quoted, and I, I didn't realize I was saying it that much, but let's lock shields. Let's lock shields, and let's get together, and let's put God's glorious, beautiful name on display. This is how we glorify God in Titus 2. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's glorify the one who's worthy of all. Let's pray. Father, we want to put that name on display. I want to be that aluminum can. I want your glory to reflect and to shine and show the world the beauty of you. God, you are altogether lovely. You are intrinsically glorious. And we worship you this morning. We have praised you and our hearts love you. And we want to be submissive. And so as we look to this word this morning, there is no other response but for us by your spirit to lead and guide us how to do this in each other's lives. So I pray that the, the women will do this in each other's lives. And I pray that the men will rise up and we will do what these young men need. God, let us be a, a unified whole, a symphony, and where the enemy will, will not even have anything to bring against us. All they can say is, man, those guys love each other. Lord, I, I just pray what a beautiful thing it would be that they could find nothing to, to bring a charge against us. God, we thank you. We thank you for the glory and the beauty of the church of God. And I think of that hymn, Rise up, O men of God. Be done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and voice to serve the King of Kings. Amen.